Hey there folks, welcome to lesson 20 in the CompTIA Network Plus course. Today's lesson is all about denial of service. Now, before we jump into the gist of things, please remember to give the video a like if you haven't done so already. And if you'd like to know when the next lesson or any other lesson this channel comes out, remember to also subscribe. Alright, so first things first, what is denial of service? Well, the first thing you need to know is denial of service is often referred to as DOS for short. Capital D, small o, capital S, which obviously stands for denial of service. So if you see that written somewhere in the manual, somewhere in the slide, somewhere in this, somewhere in that, or let's say in the exam, because that's a very good likelihood, at least now you know what the abbreviation stands for. It stands for denial of service. So usually in most cases, denial of service will probably be an attack of some kind. It's gonna come in one shape or another, but it generally comes down to some form of an attack taking place on something. The question is on what and to what extent. All right, so what could it be? It could be an actual service running on a computer or running on a server that's being denied. So when we say an actual service, this is an actual service running in the background. So just to clarify, I've got a virtual machine running here in the background. So let me just quickly flip over to that just to show you guys what I'm talking about. So here it goes. A few moments later. And here we are on that virtual machine. So it's running Windows 11, not that that matters. So whether it's running Windows 11, Windows 10 or something server-wise, doesn't matter. So I'm going to go here to the bottom, I'm just going to run a search for, let's say, services. There's probably like 10, 20 different ways you can access this. I'm just running a search for it. Good old fashioned services. There it is. Let's click on that sucker there. Give it a moment to open. And there we go, folks. So here are many of the services that's in the background on your machine. You can see some of these services are running. Some of them are not. Some of them are manual. Some of them are not. Now, there's quite a lot of these services that if they're not running in the background, something on your machine, your client or user's machine, or on your server will cease to function. One of the most common services in this list of services that gets denied by denial of service attack is most commonly going to be the print spooler. It can actually be anything, but based on my experience in the past, uh, when I went to my clients, it's most commonly gonna be this one right here. Now, this service, is on all client machines as well as servers. It's always running. It's always going to start automatically. And in case you haven't guessed it already, it's got something to do with a printer because it says that in the name. It says print something something spooler. So this is the cue to your printer. So if you are the only person plugged into this printer, let's say it's one of those small ones on your desk, it's gonna go into the queue when you print something and it's gonna instantaneously pretty much for the most part come out of the queue and get printed that document. Now, if you're using one of those big printers that you're sharing, you know, amongst colleagues at the office, one of those that gets shared by 20, 30, 50, 100 people, it's those big ones. In that situation, your document's gonna go into the queue and it's probably gonna stay there for a couple of minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes or so, depending on how many other people are printing and whether they um, basically send their print jobs to the server first or not. So that's basically what the principle is for. Now, this service is gonna be running whether you've got a printer or not. And if it's not running, what's gonna happen is, and this is what the denial service attack will do, it'll basically go and do this. It's basically gonna go and turn it off to that extent, like that. And now when you go and print, it'll either do nothing. Sometimes you'll see it's gonna send it to the printer. It's gonna look like nothing, you know, out of the ordinary. It's gonna look completely normal. And if you go to the printer, you'll see the printer actually shows it's on, completely normal, except the print job never actually comes out. Yeah, pretty weird. Other instances what you might encounter or the user might encounter is it might pop up with some sort of error message of some kind telling you that you need to install a printer first. Meanwhile, you already have a printer installed. It might even be plugged in. It might be turned on, everything. And yet it tells you you need to install a printer. And this causes a lot of confusion for the user and sometimes even the technician being you now. So the next time you see that, just do yourself a favor, go and check if the print spooler is running. It could be that some sort of malware has been installed or is taking place here and is denying this service. As a temporary solution or a temporary, temporary workaround, you can just go and manually right click on that sucker, 
say start and that should temporarily solve the problem but if that malware is still in the background it's probably 10 to 1 going to go and turn that off again anyways let's go back to that list of mine all right here we are again okay so we've established it could be an actual service running on a computer or a server like i just demonstrated for you guys now what it could also be is it could be an actual server not service server where access is being denied to this server can of course be internal inside your company the client's company it can be an external server of some kind the point here is access to this server and whatever service it's rendering is being denied what it could also be is it could be a website where access is being denied to this is actually very popular so besides the service one which i've got in purple there for you guys website very very common where you're going to see this kinds of attack being um, being carried out on website once again could be internal or public more than likely it's going to be a public website though and then lastly on this list of mine it could be a design flaw that someone is exploiting so there's some guy out there probably in his mom's basement you know if i have to thumb suck it here he or she's got nothing better to do with their time and they've discovered some sort of vulnerability in some sort of something, some sort of platform, website, service, you name it. And they're now actively exploiting it to go and cause some sort of denial of service attack. Why do those guys do it? Sometimes for financial gain, other times just for, for kicks and gags, I've seen. So it can be for any amount of reasons. Now, speaking of reasons, here we've got reasons for denial of service attack, since we're mentioning it anyway. So... I'm going to mention a couple of you guys. It's obviously not listed to, uh, limited to the list I'm about to give you guys. The first one I've got for you guys is disgruntled employee. So sometimes you'll have a person that's currently in the company or he or she has just left the company. This person is now basically upset for the lack of a better description. They're unhappy because they did not get that bonus they were hoping for. They're unhappy because they did not get that pay increase they were hoping for. Maybe that promotion they were hoping for. Sometimes it's something completely silly. Sometimes the boss or someone just gives another employee a little bit more attention and this employee is upset about that. Kind of like a child. You get that. Believe it or not, it happens. So it could be a disgruntled employee that's carrying out some sort of denial of service attack. That could be a reason. Another reason is to cause a system or a service to be unavailable. The reason behind that, so it's a reason within a reason, <laughs> it can be anything. It could be that this person is just not happy of you or the company, kind of same as a disgruntled employee. It could be a competitor for all you know. So whatever service you're rendering here, it could be a website, could be something otherwise. The service you're rendering is now basically competition for your competitor. And if they can somehow bring down the service that you are rendering, all of your potential clients, customers, and what have you is now going to go to other sources like your competitor. So yeah, this is actually, yeah, all is fair in love and war, as they say, yeah, scary. Another reason could be it is a distraction for something else taking place, possibly an even more serious threat happening in the background. The point here is, these perpetrators, the hackers, these malicious software users, they are trying to distract you. This is very much like a magic trick, actually. So if you go look at a proper, proper magic show, whether you're checking it online or in person, very often the magician is distracting you at one place while something else is happening somewhere else. So you might see the magician showing you his or her right hand with a ball or something in the hand. Meanwhile, in the background, the guy or the lady is doing something else with the other hand and you're not paying attention because they're swinging the right hand in front of your eyes. So that is a distraction. And the same thing can be said about these denial of service attacks. It could be that the end goal here was never to actually bring down the service. Whether I get it done successfully or not, that is not my end goal here. I am carrying out this denial of service attack because I'm trying to distract you from some other shenanigans that I'm up to. I'm actively hacking into something, breaking into something, doing something else not so nice. So it could be a smoke screen, if you want to call it something. A denial of service attack could also be accidental. This actually does happen. It's rare, but it could be accidental. Maybe you, a coworker, or someone, you know, it's a client of yours, 
he or she did some sort of configuration, they changed something, and oopsie daisy, before you know it, there's a denial of service attack. This can be both digital, software wise, it could be physical. So if we're talking physical here, it could be something old school like you plugging a network cable back into the same network. I'm not sure if you guys are aware of that, but if you take a network cable and you plug it into a switch and you take the other end of that network cable and you plug it back into the same switch or even the same network anywhere else along the line, that causes what we call a loop in the network. Same signal gets, keeps getting sent in a loop, a loop, a loop, and it's going to bring down the network. This used to be a very big problem back in the day. Luckily for us these days, not such a big deal anymore because the switches these days are clever. As soon as they detect a loop like that, they drop the packet and it turns it off and it doesn't cause the loop anymore. This is known as spanning tree for the folks that's curious how that all works. Most switches these days have spanning tree and it's normally turned on by default. So it's not something you really have to worry about. Other forms of denial of service attack could be that maybe you configured something on an actual server configuration. Maybe you configured something on a firewall, some sort of configuration, and before you know it, someone, you, the whole company, is all blocked from a certain something. So it could really be an accident. It happens. It happens to the best of us. It even happens to me a couple of times. Another reason I've got here, which is the last one on this particular list, is the service is being overloaded and it's being forced to fail. So this is obviously on purpose when we say it's being overloaded and forced to fail. It is on purpose. So it's normally one or more people outside your company. It could be one or more devices executing this attack now. And they're trying to overload something like a website or a server. Those are very good examples. Um, they're overloading it. And that's going to obviously cause it to fail because it can only handle an X amount of load. One of the most popular and well-known ways of overloading a server and a website is by using what we call a bot network. Bots, in other words. So that brings me to my next topic here. I'm throwing this in for you guys as an extra because it kind of goes hand in hand with denial of service. So what is a bot? We'll get to botnet in just a moment. So let's start off with what is a bot? So usually a bot is some form of malware that gets installed onto a computer, making it a bot. Now there's many ways you can get this malware on your machine. And I mean, not so long ago, if you go look at countries like Germany, Germany is a very technologically advanced country. And this is happening in Germany, where at some point in time, up to 40% of the computers in Germany were part of a bot network. They were a bot at some point in time. So that's how scary this is. That is how easy it is for a PC to become a bot. So this could be something as simple as you or the user just clicking on a link that says, hey, click on this, check this out. Or it could be that you or the user downloaded something and this something is now a Trojan horse. If you remember in some of my previous lessons, a Trojan horse is something pretending to be one thing when in reality it's something else. It's pretending to be something useful. It's pretending to be some sort of cool program, some sort of cool game. You or the user install it. Meanwhile, it is doing something else in the background. So in this case, it's a bot in the background and it's basically doing all kinds of not so nice things in the background. So yeah, many, many ways your PC can become a bot or the user's PC can become a bot. Now, if a machine is a bot, what does that actually mean? It gives someone remote control over a computer and it's usually without the user's knowledge. Kind of like a Trojan horse if you think about it. So now when you or the user's machine becomes a bot, you can be using your machine just like you would every day would go and do. None the wiser that your machine or the client's machine has just been turned into a bot. So that means someone else out there in the world has now got remote control over your machine and you're not aware of that. And when they've got remote control over your machine in the form of a bot, there's many things they can go and do with your machine, which is all not so nice. Now, when your machine becomes a bot, there's something else you should be aware of. It's also referred to as a zombie computer. So since we're saying zombie PC, here's a nice little picture for you guys. <laughs> Funny little cartoon picture. Look at that. So you can see this little guy there with his little remote and he's controlling your machine. That's pretty much what it comes down to. So you are still able to use this machine for the most part. You would normally not know that it's a zombie PC or a bot. But someone else at the same time has now got control over that machine and they can do many things with that machine. What they can actually go and do with that machine, that we'll get to in a moment. I'll make you guys a nice little list and show you guys what they can actually go and do with your machine. 
just in case you're curious. So looking at this, what we've just said here, and looking at that picture of mine, you can think of this bot, which is now your machine or the client's machine that's been infected, as a puppet. And you can think of the person controlling that bot or that puppet as the puppet master. Kind of scary, I know. It's freaky. Anyway, so let's get to that next topic, which is what is a botnet? So I mentioned botnet to you guys earlier. So a botnet, not a bot, a botnet is a collection of individual bots, which is called a botnet. So if you've got two or more machines now that's been infected of these uh, malware software, which is turning them into bots or zombie machines, we then refer to that as a botnet. That's basically what a botnet is. It's just combining multiple bots or combining multiple zombie machines together, and that gives you what is known as a botnet. Now, this network of machines, which we call a botnet, can obviously grow very, very large. So much so that the network of computers can reach enormous dimensions. Sometimes thousands or even millions of zombies are combined into a network. Yes, millions. There is some zombie networks out there or bot network out there that contain more bots than there is population in some countries. Now that is a thought for you, isn't it? Scary. Can you imagine what I can achieve with that? So if I have a botnet that consists of a couple of million bots inside of it, a couple of million computers in other words, what can I achieve with that? So that brings me to this section here. What do these botnets do? So some are programmed literally just to go and send out very large volumes of spam. It could be a small volume, but it's usually to send out very large volumes of spam because obviously if I want to go and send out spam, I'll be very stupid to go and use my own machine for that. That's not very wise. I'm going to go and use your machine to go and do it. I'm going to make your machine a bot and I'm going to have your machine basically do it for me, do my bidding for me. And if uh, your machine gets banned or blocked or whatever, that's not my problem. That's your problem. And I'm just going to go on to the next machine and the next machine. So that's a very nice way of getting out very large volumes of spam. And what do these bot networks also do? Some spy on the users and become what is known as sniffers. Now, when we say spy, you'll be surprised to know what they can actually see and what they can actually go and do. So it's kind of a form of spyware. So spying wise, they will normally look for things like credit card numbers, all kinds of bank card numbers. They will look for banking details, bank account numbers, passwords, anything sensitive, anything of value. So very clearly you can see this is very dangerous. These bot networks can also be used to relay traffic, basically a proxy of sorts. So if I am going to go and get up to some sort of shenanigans online, I'm not going to go and use my direct internet connection because if you or someone trace me, I don't want you or that someone to trace me back to my house or wherever the heck I'm sitting at that point in time. That's a no-go. So instead, I'm going to be using these bot PCs and I'm going to basically use them as stepping stones. I'm going to hop via them. And when someone traces me, they will trace me to that bot, which is now you or that user. This can also be used for all kinds of other shenanigans. So sometimes these botnets will be sold to the highest bidder online, you know, normally on the black web, dark web, I think is what they call it, dark web. So normally get sold to the highest bidder on the dark web, and they will go and use this for all kinds of evil shenanigans that you don't want to be involved on. So now here you are part of a crime and you don't even know it. And the next day, the boys in blue are knocking on your door. And now here you are all confused, wondering why the police is at your door. Meanwhile, your PC was used as a mule. These botnets were also used for double DOS. So that stands for distributed denial of service attack. So we already know the DOS stands for denial of service attack. But the extra D in the front stands for distributed denial of service attack. So this is now when I go and take a whole bunch of bots, obviously, because it says botnets, and I go and use these machines to go do my bidding to a large extent. And this could be to bring down a server or bring down a website by overloading it. You remember earlier we said it could be that a server or website is forced offline. You can go and force it down by overloading it. And this is done by distributed denial of service attack. So this is when I've got many, many zombie PCs. 
and I, I give them an instruction, all of them at the same time, to attack the same website or to attack the same server at the same time. And that server maybe can only handle, let's say, 10,000 pieces at a given time. And now here it is, 100,000 pieces visiting that server or that website at the same time. It's going to overload it. It's going to bring it down. So, yeah, pretty scary, right? So these bot networks, lastly, guys, can also be used to crack passwords. Yeah, you heard me, crack passwords. That is why you'll find most softwares, most websites, most platforms will force you to have some sort of very long, complicated password. Normally, there's certain complexity requirements that needs to be met here. Has to be a minimum of eight characters, uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. And that is in case someone is trying to crack your password. What's also very annoying, and this is actually a very good thing, is you'll normally notice that sometimes these passwords tend to expire, especially in a company environment like on a domain. That is in case someone's actively trying to crack it. Now, depending on what machine I'm using and what software I'm using, that will determine how long I take to crack this password. And you'll be surprised to know that if I use a bot network to try and crack your password, I could potentially have thousands, if not millions of machines working all together. This is basically what we would refer to as a supercomputer. Supercomputer cracking that password, where it would normally take me three months, six months, or a year to crack that password. Now, sometimes I can crack it as little as 24 hours. That is how we crack passwords. At least that's one of the ways we crack passwords. This gets very scary, doesn't it? All right, folks. So hopefully you've learned something. Might have scared you guys a little bit. So I'm not trying to scare you guys off. If you have learned something, do me a favor. Boink that like button. It shows me that you guys have enjoyed the content. And if you've enjoyed it, feel free to also drop a comment down below. I mean, that also shows me that you've enjoyed it. And like usual, guys, if you'd like to know when the next lesson in CompTIA Network Plus comes out or any of those other videos of my courses, remember to also subscribe. Lastly, folks, that usual special shout out to the sponsors of this channel, those PayPal sponsors, Patreon sponsors. Thank you very much, guys. I really do appreciate the donations. And then also for the guys that's clicked on the thanks button below the video, I also get those. Thank you very, very much, guys. If you guys would like to sponsor the channel, you can find all of that information in the video description down below. But alternatively, you can just go and make use of that thanks button below the video that I just spoke of. All right, guys, see you in the next lesson of the CompTIA Network Plus course, which is lesson 21. Peace out.